Welcome to Break Forth Fully Alive. We are Elsa and Arlen Salty, your hosts and the directors and founders of Break Forth Ministries. We can all use a little inspiration in our day, and that's why Break Forth Fully Alive is here for you. After four decades of holding events throughout the world, we're pulling together some of the best of the best messages and classes from these events. But before we get into today's show, we want to invite you to head over to our website at BreakforthMinistries.com, where you'll learn more about our tours to the lands of the Bible, our resources, inspiring videos, workshops, our events, and more. Now, let's get started. John Eldridge is an American author, counselor, and teacher. He's authored many books, but is known for his best-selling book, Wild at Heart. For the past 21 years, he has run Ransomed Heart, a ministry dedicated to helping people discover the heart of God and to learn to live in God's love. To find out more about John, go to wildatheart.org. The church today does a great job of teaching people the Word of God and how to worship God, but what is often lacking is teaching people how to have a conversational intimacy with God. God is constantly speaking to us, but it seems like we're often unable to tune in to what he is saying. Be still and listen. John teaches on what it means to listen for God's voice and grow closer to the heart of God. Now here is John Eldridge. It's my 30th anniversary, birthday, I guess, uh, when I came to Christ uh, back in 1979. I was not, was not raised in the church. I didn't have any background in any of this and, and uh, gave my life to Christ. I was 19 and uh, took off in my 68 Volkswagen Squareback with a buddy, and we were going from California to Montana, going on an adventure with God. And somewhere outside Jackson, Wyoming, we are way down this dirt road. We're off in the middle of nowhere. We're looking for this fishing hole that some guy had told us about at a gas station. And uh, I looked down and I realized we are out of gas. And I just thought, Oh, we are so hosed. And I'm a brand new believer. I don't know what to do, but there's God, you know? And so I said, God, you got to help us. I mean, we're, we're toast. I, we are completely out of gas. And God spoke. And he said, I'll bring you gas. And I thought, far out. <laughs> wow, I love this. And so we just grabbed our fishing rods and went down to the, the river. And a couple hours later, we came up to get a sandwich, and this car is driving by. And some people pull over, and we're chatting with them a little bit. And they said, hey, we're running into town. Is there anything you need? And uh, I said, well, now, if you could give me a ride, that'd be awesome. We ran out of gas here, and I need to pick up some gas. And they said, oh, no problem. We'll bring you gas. I, I thought at the time that the, that was just the way everybody lived. I mean, I thought that was the, that was the normal Christian life. And um, I, I actually was not too far from the truth. John chapter 10, when Jesus says, I tell you the truth, the man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The man who enters the gate is the shepherd of his sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. He says uh, a little bit later, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep. My sheep knows me just as the father knows me and I know the father. 
I lay down my life for my sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this pen. I must bring them also, and they too will listen to my voice. And there'll be one flock and one shepherd. And then finally down in verse 27, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. Several years ago, um, living in Colorado, some friends gave us an amazing gift. They gave us a, a family vacation, a week, at a dude ranch in Colorado. And it was the best family vacation we've ever had. I mean, the boys loved it, and horses, and pancake breakfasts, and all that. So the next year, uh, it's about February, and Stacy and I are praying about what we're going to do for for summer and and what God might have for us and we're like we're going back I mean if there's any way we we're going back and we prayed about it and we felt like God said no no we're like no actually I was praying first about it I prayed three times I didn't like the answer so I pretended that I didn't hear and so I kind of you know how you do that I kind of came back and tried it again and no. Finally, I went to Stacy and I said, "Hun, I don't think I'm hearing God. Um, <laughs> would you pray about this? And so she prayed. She came back. I could tell. I could see just the expression on her face. She said, we don't get to go. I was so bummed. That was February. The week that we were going to go was in June. And that was the week the Haman fire swept through Colorado, burned hundreds of thousands of acres of uh, forest, including that ranch burned all around it. Everybody had to be evacuated. Jesus in John 10 gives us the invitation. And the invitation is phenomenal. I mean, if people knew what Christianity was about, he says, I have come that you may have life. I want life for you. I really do. But he also gives us the setting. And the setting is you live in a dangerous world. There is a thief, and he comes to steal and kill and destroy. And so if you want the life in this dangerous world, then he gives you the condition. Listen to my voice. Listen. Listen to me. After that trip to Montana, back when I first became a believer, Um, I joined a church uh, down the street, and it was a great church. These people loved the scriptures. They they taught me to read the Bible. They taught me to worship, um, joined a a small home group. It, It was awesome, and they really did disciple me. But they didn't teach conversational intimacy with God. There's a large portion of the church today that have been given the understanding that God only speaks to us through the Bible. And the irony of that belief is that that's not what the Bible says. The Bible is first, the Bible is the bedrock, the Bible is the foundation of our faith, and it's the standard by which we judge everything. And the Bible invites us to hear God's voice. I mean, you have all those stories in the Bible of God speaking to his people, right? Now, why would God give that to you and then say, but you can't have that? I mean, why would God give you a book of exceptions? It's like giving you a map to Los Angeles, but you're trying to find your way around Toronto. You're like, well, it's just, it doesn't, you just told me it doesn't apply to me, Right? He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's the same speaking God. And and the God of the Bible is a speaking God, is he not? I mean, he speaks the whole creation into existence. The second member of the Trinity is called the Word of God. God speaks, and it's the nature of God to speak and to communicate all those stories of him speaking to his people. And it's the nature of man to communicate. I mean... We're doing it right now. It's just so core to human nature to communicate and to listen and to hear. So God speaks. We're designed to hear his voice. And then Jesus explains, look, this is, 
This is the offer. You live in a dangerous world. I really do want life for you, but you've got to listen. Listen for my voice. Which is why Paul prays in Ephesians chapter 1. He says, I pray that you would have the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Wisdom is beautiful, but wisdom is insufficient. I mean, the Bible doesn't say anything about chemotherapy, right? There's all kinds of subjects the Bible does not speak to, right? It doesn't say anything about astrophysics or, you know, where, you know, to get married or when to get married or who to marry other than a believer, right? I mean, there's guidelines, but there's so many questions we have about our life. Do I go back to college, right? All those dreams that Erwin was talking about last night that God has put in us. We need a lot of counsel. We need guidance. We need a shepherd. And the scripture invites us to hear his voice. It's interesting. In, in um, John chapter 5, Jesus says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have life, but it is they which testify of me. And you refuse to come to me to have life. Again, the offer is life. The offer is phenomenal, okay? But the condition is come to me, intimacy with God. We are created for an intimate communion with Jesus, to know God really. Look at the, look at the progression that the scriptures give us it says, um, we are his sheep, and he is the shepherd. And then it goes on to say, we are his servants, and he is our master. It kind of grows, right? And then it goes on to say, we are his children. He is our father. There's a progression to it. And most Christians get stuck at the servant level, right? I just want to serve the Lord. I just want to be a good servant of the Lord. But Jesus says, I no longer call you servants. I call you my friends, right? We, we're, we, we move from just sheep, servants, even children, right, to being the friends of God. And finally, the scripture calls us his beloved. We are his lovers. Now, can you imagine any relationship surviving without communication? I mean, you meet a dad, you're talking to him about his kids, and you say, so, you know, what have you been talking to your kids about lately? And he says, oh, I don't talk to them, but I love them very much. <laughs> kind of go, whoa, who's this joker? What's this about? You don't talk to your children, you know, or some husband, right, who says, you know, I've decided that my wife and I are just going to stick to the written word so that there's no misunderstanding. So I just leave her post-it notes I put them on the refrigerator in the morning. Just the written word, honey. That's it. All relationship requires an intimate and a growing and a regular communication. It's absolutely crucial to us. We have to have it, and the scriptures invite us to it. It's actually the normal Christian life. But I didn't know that for years until we began to experience God speaking. And then you had to reconcile that to what the scriptures say and all the gifts that he has given and all the warnings that he has offered. I mean, even, even this morning, it was so beautiful. A friend had written me a note of encouragement and uh, I had tucked it in my Bible. And then I was sitting in my hotel room this morning, got up early, was looking over my notes, praying and I found myself getting really nervous about this. And uh, I just looked over, and the note was poking out of my Bible, and I could just see what he had written, and it literally just says, don't be afraid. I'm like, Lord, that was just so kind. That was so loving. That was so encouraging. God is speaking all the time. There, there is this naivete that's entered into the church and into the Christian life. I think most good people, most God-loving Christians think life works like this. It's sort of A plus B equals C. 
love God, live a good life, and he'll deliver the rest. That's how most Christians I know live, right? You love God, believe God, and just try and do what you know is right, and then God will deliver the rest. And Jesus says, no, you live in a world at war. You have an enemy. There's false shepherds and the false, by the way. Lord, deliver us from the false. I mean, it is a very difficult thing to navigate, even in Christianity, maybe especially in Christianity, right? He says there's false shepherds, there's wolves, there's a thief. Please, you've got to stay close to me. The condition for finding the life is to listen to his voice. Okay, so God speaks to us in many ways. He obviously first and foremost speaks to us through the scriptures. And they're the, they're the bedrock of our faith and, and they're the standard by which we judge everything else. But he speaks to us in a lot of ways as well. Scripture says he speaks through creation. He has this thing going on between, between us with hawks. He knows I love hawks, red-tailed hawks, and gosh hawks, there's golden hawks in Colorado. And uh, I, he'll just bring them across my path during the day, almost as a way of saying, I love you, I see you, boo, you know. He'll just do it, and, and he'll, the timing of it is so undeniable. Stacy and I are driving to a conference in Colorado, and, and we were late, and I'm driving, and, and she's making some suggestions for how we, how we might change things and for the worship that morning, right? And, and I'm kind of blowing her off, you know, I'm thinking, ah, you know, and... And, and right at that moment, this hawk literally swoops across the front of the car, just whoosh. And I'm like, okay, okay, I'm listening. She's right, I'm wrong, okay, okay. He'll, he speaks through creation. He speaks through the counsel of, of others, of godly people. God speaks through Balaam's donkey. I mean, he can do whatever he wants. But the scriptures invite us to grow to the place where what we are experiencing is a conversational intimacy with Jesus, where we learn to hear his voice. And so I want to explain a little bit of that this morning. First off, in order to hear the voice of God, well, one, you have to believe that he speaks, right? So John 10, Revelation 3, right? The letter to the church. He says, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice. Now, the technical interpretation of that is hear his voice, okay? That would be the, as in hear his voice, okay? He says, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in and, and we'll be intimate together, okay? So you got to believe he speaks. But, but to cultivate conversational intimacy, kind of step one is you, you have to learn to quiet down. The chaos, the busyness, the noise, the thousands of distractions. I mean, you watch Jesus do it, and you see a practice down through the ages in Christian history is getting away, withdrawing from the poison of culture, and just quiet yourself, just quiet. That alone will do you an enormous good. And then I found that it's really helpful to begin by asking simple questions. Simple questions, right? You cannot hear the voice of God when you're asking things that are full of drama, okay? Lord, do I have cancer? You know, Lord, do I marry Ted? You know, do we sell the family business tomorrow? It just, I find personally that paranoia never helps me hear. You have to start with simple questions. And, and sometimes I'll just quiet myself and I'll say, Father, what are you saying? And more often than not, he says, I love you. I love you. You begin with simple questions. And then here's the key. The key part is that we surrender. If I come to God with a question and I'm not willing to hear no 
it's pretty unlikely that I'm going to hear from him at all. I'm not open to the conversation. I'm just looking for permission or approval, you know. I've got my agenda, my passions, even my dreams. Right? And I have to be in a posture of surrender to be able to hear God. And I want to hear God. Okay, so what's so beautiful about this is that we come to God because we need counsel or we need direction or guidance. We need clarity. And we come away with a deeper holiness because we're learning to yield, learning to give all things over to him, learning to surrender. All right, so that can we go to the ranch? And, and Jesus says, no, don't go. And thank God we listened, right? Or we, that would have been our whole family vacation right there, up in flames, you know? So many things God has rescued us from because we were willing to hear yes, no, now, later, you know, hang on, I've got a different way I want you to pursue that. Everyone was talking about discovering your dreams and unearthing them from the rubble of your life last night. And so much of that involves a conversational intimacy. All of this, for me, all of this began, my writing and speaking and all of this. I was a counselor. I had a private practice in Colorado Springs. I was sitting in a, in a counseling session. It was a marriage session one night. And, I, and I'm listening to a couple, and uh, God starts speaking to me during the session. And he says, you know, he says, you're pretty good at this. <laughs> I'm like, well, thanks. I think, you know, and he says, but John, look what you're doing. He says, you're talking to two people. I want you to talk to many more. <laughs> I'm like, what? what are, you know, and then I, I, we finished the session and I'm like, what was that about? You know, and then he kind of guided us into the dreams and what became writing and speaking. And so you have to listen. We have to cultivate a listening. I want to do it right now. What we're going to do is practice this. So set down your stuff and we're going to quiet ourselves we're going to ask a simple question, and we're going to let Jesus speak to us. Okay? Now, there may be something that is really on your heart to ask him. Well, ask him. But also be open to that he might want to answer something else. He might want to say something else. So let's just pray. Just quiet yourself. And as soon as I do, oh my goodness, I'm just aware of all of the chatter inside. And so I have to begin to let that go. Lord, what do they think of me? Am I doing okay? You know, or you start thinking about that phone call that you had with your mom last night. And you just, see, the beauty of this is you just let all of that go. It's learning to simply be present to God. And uh, I often find that it helps to kind of consecrate myself. And so, Jesus, I give to you again today my life. I give to you my spirit, my soul, and my body. I give to you my heart and my mind and my will. I just consecrate myself to God. Lord, I pray that you would cleanse us in a fresh way with your blood. Cleanse my ears, and my eyes, cleanse my heart and my will. And by your Holy Spirit, restore me in you and you in me. Restore our union. Jesus, I give myself to you. And as I quiet, I'm just letting people go people I love, people I care about, and just let them go, quiet myself. And then we ask God a simple question. There may be something that is on your heart to ask him. Maybe as Erwin was talking, some dreams were surfacing last night, desires, hopes, longings. Or sometimes I just... I just ask God, what are you saying, Father? And while we're doing this, we're surrendering. We're yielding the drama, the need. Uh, we surrender our will. Lord, you can say anything to me you want to say. 
and surrender to you. And we listen. Sometimes if I start wandering, I have to come back and I find it's helpful to simply repeat the question. Jesus, do you want us to go to break forth? That was the question I was asking before we came here. Lord, is this your will? Do you want us? And I'll just sit there with the question for a while. Jesus, what are you saying, Lord? What are you saying? Give me eyes to see and ears to hear. Now, here's something that's really important as we're, as we're practicing the presence of God, as we're learning to, to tune in to what he is speaking to us, and he is speaking all the time. Um, I find that sometimes I don't hear. And, and just start with, that's okay. Whether or not I can tune in to what God is saying on any given day is not the verdict on your relationship, okay? You, you, you cannot go there. Your relationship with God is secured through Jesus Christ. Shed blood, this life given to you, God adopting you and embracing you. Scripture says you belong to God and that we have peace with God now through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, whether I can tune in on any given day or any given question, that has nothing to do with our relationship. You are secure in Christ. And, and I almost have to remind myself of that because the last thing you want to do is kind of get tweaked on this because when I'm tweaked, I can't hear, right? I get all, you know, Woot, something's wrong. I'm blowing it. I'm in sin or something, you know. Calm down, calm down. Let it go. You're loved all is well, all is well. And then I'll just come back to it another day. However, there are other reasons we don't hear. Sometimes because, frankly, I'm not open to hearing, right? If we're really honest, the reason that we don't ask God much is because if we hear him, now we're faced with a dilemma, right? We have to obey. And so we sort of choose a moral ignorance, you know, it's just easier to blast through life and then hope he blesses it, you know, rather than learning to follow, surrender, yield. But there's another reason. We have an enemy. We had some dear friends over to dinner. Oh, this is several years ago now. A pastor and his wife, great people, great people, love God, been a pastor for years and years and years. And we hadn't seen him for a while. So we were doing the typical catching up thing. How are your kids? What have you been doing? You know, that sort of thing. And um, about halfway through dinner and conversation, she stops us and she says, hold on a second. She says, you guys keep using the expression, then God said, or then you ask God. And she said, I've been a Christian for 30 years. I've never heard the voice of God. And I said, well, um, call her Mary. Mary, maybe that's not your fault. Immediately there were tears. And she's sitting there crying. And I said, Mary, maybe there are reasons that you don't hear the voice of God. Maybe something's in the way, you know. Why don't we ask God about that? So we literally just stopped dinner, went out to the living room, sat down. And we kind of started praying together. And uh, one of the things you'll discover is it is a lot easier to hear God for other people than it is to hear for yourself. You know, because it's your drama. I mean, when you, you know, when you're in it, it's just you can't see the forest for the trees, right? You know how that goes. But somebody else's life, there's sort of that benevolent detachment, you know, and so you, you got a little bit of distance there. Anyway, we start praying for her, and uh, Stacy looks up at me and she says, well, she says, I, I hear the word abandonment. And I'm like, Mary, does that make sense? You ever felt abandoned? Okay, now there's major tears. She's weeping. And I said, by God? And so she told us the story. 
30 years before, brand new Christian. And uh, she had a baby who was really colicky and he was a screamer. And he was just screaming all the time. And she just, you know, poor young mom. And she just cried out to God to intervene. And the baby, you know, didn't get better. And, and the enemy was there in a moment. The enemy is always trying to put his spin on our lives, his interpretation of things. And he says, you see, God's abandoned you. And something in her heart said, that's true. She made an agreement with it. And she said, I'm abandoned. God's abandoned me. And then boom, the curtain fell. A veil, a block. Of course, it's going to be hard to hear from God after that point. And so I said, Jesus, we're praying. And I'm like, Lord, what do you want to do with this? And, and he said, have her break the agreement. She's made an agreement with a lie. And the enemy is really holding this against her now. And so I'm like, okay, Mary, you got to break that agreement. And you start with scripture. I mean, Hebrews, right? God will never leave you nor forsake you. You are not abandoned. And she said, okay. So almost in a pure act of will, she breaks the agreement. And uh, now there's a lot of tears. And she's crying over that. And we're inviting Christ in and stuff. And it was a beautiful moment. I'm compacting a, a story in just a few seconds here. But... It's a beautiful thing, and she's crying and inviting Christ, and I'm sorry for that, and you haven't forsaken me, and I love you, and then it's quiet for a little bit, and I'm listening, and I'm going, God, what do you want us to do now? And he says, ask her to listen to my voice. <laughs> I'm like, you had better speak. I mean, we are way out there. I did the things you asked me to do, you know? And so I'm like, okay. And said, Mary, I think, I think Jesus wants to talk to you now. Let's ask him, let's ask him to speak and see if you hear his voice. And, and so, you know, we speak and then we're just, I mean, we pray and we're just kind of quiet for a few minutes. And I'm like, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, you know, you know, and, and, uh, and I see her crying, but her face is different. And I said, Mary, are you okay? And she says, yeah. She says, I heard his voice. He told me he loves me. And I'm like, Jesus, thank you. 30 years a believer never experienced something that frankly is available to everyone. It's normal. It's the normal experience to be intimate with God. It's what you're created for. The Christian life is not meant to be merely obedience or service or even worship. Christian life is meant to be intimacy. And then out of the intimacy, all that stuff just flows. It just comes, right? He's the vine, we're the branch. That close. And then his life just flows through us. Right? So sometimes when we're having a hard time hearing, there may be reasons why. right? And so we ask God about that. And you'll find it is helpful to get others to help you to listen when you're stuck and, and you're wondering, God, you know, what's going on? How come I can't hear? And, and what are you doing? It also helps to test it. You want to test it, okay? Paul says, test everything. Test everything, okay? You don't just follow the first thought that comes into your head, you know? We have the scriptures. We run everything through the scriptures, all right? You have wisdom. When I hear something that sounds crazy, I, I got to get confirmation on that. So I'm sitting in my office after that counseling session, and God says, you know, you're good at this, but this isn't what I want you to be doing with your life. And, and so afterwards, I'm praying about that. And I said, what do you want me to do? He said, shut down your practice. <laughs> I'm like, what? He says, shut down your practice, and, uh, and I'll bring you the next thing. And I'm like, this is nuts, you know? And so I got to get confirmation on that. Well, part of the confirmation came when that week the phone rang three times, and it was two invitations to speak, and it was an invitation from my publisher to write. And I'm like, okay, all right, there's confirmations coming in. You're leading here. So you test things. You look for confirmation. You get counsel you know, from others, and it's always so helpful. Please ask the next question, 
right? So you say, you know, dreams and desires and hopes and longings. You say, Lord, I want to, you know, I want to go get a graduate degree. I want to, I want to write. I want to do movies. I want to move, you know, to someplace warmer, right? And, and, and listen, and you, and you kind of get a sense, you, you, you hear God internally is where he speaks because Christ lives in our hearts. He says, yes, right? Well, please ask him when you ask the next question. So oftentimes what happens is we get an answer and do, you know, we're off and God's like two years from now. And you're like, oh, wow, that would have been really helpful to know, <laughs> right? Well, ask, you stay with it. Okay, really beautiful story. Um, Stacy and I just celebrated our 25th wedding anniversary, which is a miracle of the first order. I mean, seriously, I, that, that if you want proof in the existence of God, you, you don't have to look any farther than the fact that any marriage makes it. You know, that the two of you don't end up knifing each other is, really, it's, it's, it's a miracle. So... 25 years, and this was in October, actually, and we wanted to we wanted to do something special, and we were talking about it. Maybe we'll take a trip. Maybe we'll go away somewhere. <laughs> but, ironically, we were writing a book on marriage, and we couldn't go. We had to get this thing done. So we wrote all through the holidays, and we just finished in January, in, on the 15th of this month. And so it was Thursday, we finish, we turn the book in, we're like, woo, and Friday, we're sitting around talking, and, and, um, and we ask God, you know, uh, maybe we could go somewhere now. Now, my son lives in Cal uh, California, he goes to college there, and he had just told me that it was 80 in Southern California, and he was at the beach, and I'm like, Lord, we could go to California, we could see my parents, see Sam, you know, and God says, no. I'm like, no, no, you know? And I said, well, what? And he says, Mexico. <laughs> I'm like, this is crazy. I am making this up. Mexico? We weren't even, I mean, it wasn't even on the radar. Mexico, so I blow it off. I go in my office, I'm looking up weather for California, you know, and you get on weather.com and the first thing that comes up is this banner ad and it says Mexico. I'm like, ah, but even then, even then, I'm like, no way, no way, this is crazy. This is absolutely crazy. This isn't any time to be spending money in and, and Mexico. I mean, and so Stacy had this magazine and she was flipping through it and I picked it up and I looked at the back, I just turned it over, I looked at the back cover. The back cover is only a picture of Mexico and all it says on it is divine revelation. I'm like, uncle. Uncle, okay, all right. And now the wild thing is, is like 48 hours later, we were in Mexico. I called the travel company. I said, I was so embarrassed. I'm like, I'm, I, this is really late. People probably don't do this, but you know, can, are there, is there availability? And she says, oh, guess what? She says, if you book at the last minute, it's 40% off. So people are hearing right now, Mexico. <laughs> okay, ask God, check in with him. But it was so fun because we were at a conference, we were just like this, and I was, and I was teaching on listening, uh, listening prayer. We don't want to simply make prayer speeches to God, right? You know, that's how we pray, right? Father, we thank you for this day, and blah, 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 in Jesus' name, amen. And then, oh, we just walk away. I mean, imagine doing that to your spouse I, I mean, or a friend. I, prayer isn't speech making, it's conversation. So we, I was teaching on this. We did the little exercise that we just did here. And, um, you know, I'm hoping that God is speaking. Anyway, afterwards, a guy comes up to me and he says, hey. He says, um, <clears throat> so I'm not really a mystic, right? And I'm like, when did listening to God become mystical? And, and he said, but I did, what you, I did what you said. I did what you said. I listened. And I'm like, okay. And he said, I, I heard God. He said, take Jill to St. John." St. John in the British Virgin Islands, right? He says, Jill's my wife. And I'm like, well, that's good. That's good. <laughs> and and uh, he, says, I, I, he says, I guess God wants me to take my wife to, to St. John. And I'm thinking, well, she's going to be delighted with this. And, and then he says, no, no. He says, not the end of the story. He says, so I turned to the guy next to me after you were done and everybody was leaving for lunch. And uh, 
I don't know this guy. He was just a guy sitting next to me. I said, you know what I heard? I heard God say, take Jill to St. John. He wants me to take my wife to the Bahamas. And the fellow next to him says, well, now that's really interesting. Uh, he says, I have two tickets to St. John that I've had for a year, and God has told me that they're not for me, that I'm to give them to someone else. And so I have your tickets. Far out. I'll bring you gas. You know, <laughs> you know what? I could tell you a thousand stories like that. That's the normal Christian life. It really is meant to be normal, that we practice following our shepherd, listening for his voice. This has rescued us from so many things. Oh, my gosh. All the unnecessary worry. Just all the worry that you could get rid of. I was at the office last week talking to one of my staff, and he says to me, have you talked to your assistant? Her name's Julie. She's a doll. He says, have you talked to Julie today? I said, no. He said, she is really fried at you because I had asked her to do this big project and then I had left town to go to Mexico. And, um, and he said, she's really upset. You know, you're in trouble, buddy. So I just recommend, you know, a wide berth right now. And, and I'm like, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. And so, you know, all that stuff starts in front of you. Like, what did I say? What did I do? I don't think I remember offending her. And I just paused and went, Jesus, is everything okay? And Jesus said, she's fine. And I'm like, okay, I'm not even going to obsess about this. And I did see her a couple hours later, and she was fine. All of the unnecessary things we wrestle with, all the stuff that we end up doing, right, running here and there and stuff, and God's not in it. You just go, Lord, all the rescues, oh my goodness, all the emails that he has kept me from sending, you know, Oh, I mean, I write some delicious emails. I mean, somebody says something to you, kind of snarky, you know, and so you, I mean, I, and you know how, you know how you're so articulate when you're defending yourself and brilliant and absolutely right, right? And I was right. And this person deserved it. I mean, I was holding back, you know, <clears throat> and I am ready to hit the send button and Jesus says, don't do it don't do it. Oh, you know, he's like, John, don't do it. It's just going to make, it's going to make things worse. He has rescued me from saying things that I'm not supposed to say, right? Or asking questions that I am supposed to ask. So much guidance, counsel, oh, so much unexpected joy, right? We wouldn't, we wouldn't have gone away for our 25th. We certainly wouldn't have gone to Mexico. That was crazy. And, and so much simple comfort. I mean, so many times I'll, I'll just be driving on the road and I'll just, Jesus, what are you saying? And more than anything else, what he says to me is, I love you. He keeps repeating it <laughs> because I don't get it. Really, I, I just, there's something in me that just doesn't believe it or, do, you know, you know, all of us, we have those lingering doubts. And uh, so many times, just comfort, I'm in this, I'm with you this morning. Don't be afraid. Oh, Lord, thank you. I don't, know how, I don't know how I lived without this. I don't know how I navigated this dangerous life without following. You see, the invitation is to be a follower, right? It's a good thing to be a believer, but the invitation is to be a follower, and that, that assumes someone else is leading, right? And so we listen, we let him counsel, we let him speak in all the different ways he wants to speak. The goal is intimacy. I think I could summarize the entire Bible in one phrase. Come closer. Come closer. That's the invitation. That's what you hear in the passion of the prophets and the yearning of Jesus. That's what you hear in the thirsty bride at the end of Revelation. The whole thing is come closer. Come closer. Let me love you. Let me speak. Listen to my voice. Follow me. That's the invitation. 
David in the Psalms says, you have made known to me the path of life. You have made known to me the path of life. And Jesus in John 10 says, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. That's the invitation. That's life, to find life in God like that. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Break Forth Fully Alive podcast. We pray you were richly blessed. But before we leave you, we want to remind you again to head over to our website at breakforthministries.com where you'll learn more about our tours to the lands of the Bible, our resources, inspiring videos, workshops, our online and in-person events, and more. Until next time, may you become fully alive in the love of God.